Beneath a capital city, giant Cold War atomic bunkers. Nuclear war can come tomorrow. How has one of them been transformed? This is the ultimate underground world. Deep within limestone bedrock, cavers continue the excavations of a pioneering subterranean entrepreneur. Got this hidden network and new treasures to find. And hidden beneath the surface. This is one of our secrets. Inside a 1.2 kilometer thick layer of salt sits a world first. It's amazing here. Beneath our feet lie extraordinary spaces, caves, and tunnels. The span and the size is just crazy. They've been designed and built by us. This is the only one with a castle. As well as formed by nature. But how were they created and adapted? By who and why? You've got to face your fears. Throughout history, subterranean life has captured our imagination. I feel so privileged. We're going further and deeper to unearth the mysteries, the stories, and the secrets of underground worlds. Sweden. It's the largest country in Northern Europe, sitting strategically between Russia and the West. The Swedes are a peace-loving people, and fiercely independent. This is a nation that has taken extraordinary precautions to protect itself. We had to prepare ourselves for a war by excavating an astounding 65,000 nuclear bunkers. Everyone in, in Sweden knew that the war could come. It would have been quite terrifying. But how were these impenetrable Cold War subterranean spaces created? They had to blast 65,000 cubic meters of bedrock. And how are they used to protect Sweden today? These machines take over if the grid fails. It couldn't be any better. In 2007, underground explosions shuddered through central Stockholm. 40,000 cubic meters of solid rock were being removed to tap into and extend a vast underground network that was originally dug out in the 1940s. I found this facility and it was like, yes. John Carlung was creating a unique workplace for his company. I remember I was standing in a pile of rock, only rocks everywhere, and I thought, oh no, what have we done? It, it, it was an extremely big project to achieve. And this is also in the middle of the city, so we have to remove the rock. Uh, it was extremely hard to do this. John's business stores and protects Sweden's digital information in what are known as data centers. Whatever you do on the internet is located in a data center. So when you use your cellar or you use your computer and you go out on the so-called cloud somewhere, it's always located in a data center. And that needs security. He'd found an underground location where security was built in, a subterranean space that used to be a Cold War nuclear bunker. Historian Pierre Augustin is meeting John at the Pionen facility. Hi. Hey, hi. Welcome. Thank you. To explore his vision of future security. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. This is amazing. Well, why, do, why do you have blast doors? What do you, what do you need them for? It's a, a matter of security. This is an ultra high security facility. So this is the reason that we use them. I like that you kept raw rock walls. It also shows you a bit of how this place used to be when it was used as a shelter. Actually, we have an alarm as well. We have a, a, a Second World War German sub alarm here yeah. as well. Alarm! Alarm! <laughs> and then, 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 then it's yeah. this, this sounds. I like the sound of it. Sweden was preparing itself for a war that never came. If people want to learn about the second half of the 20th century. They just have to open a door to one of these shelters. I wanted to keep something that you could get the feeling of the Cold War security, the bunker feeling, but take it to the next level. 
What did it take to convert this relic of the nuclear arms race? Architect Albert Franz Lenore was tasked with making John's vision a reality. The brief was to do something spectacular and something sci-fi related. But honestly, the, the rock does most of the job itself. <laughs> I think this is a very geekish world. People who work with the technicians, the people who work with the stuff, they're very geekish. And as me, we love science fiction. We love these kind of movies. And I think this, this, the design ideas come from that. The data center now boasts waterfalls, a vertical garden, low-lying fog and a climate-controlled suspended glass conference room. In the, the most spectacular room, we realized we really need to make this space accessible uh, for visitors, for clients. In the server room, you have a specific climate. And because of that, you need to cool down the server, and that makes a lot of noise. And that's how the idea of the hanging glass room start to grow because I was like, okay, the room is its own climate within the server room. Visitors to the Pianum facility are often struck by its resemblance to the bad guy's lair in an old James Bond film. People have always asked me if I want to buy a white cat and sit there, sit there in the middle like some kind of movie villain. This reimagined subterranean structure still plays an important role in protecting Sweden. Today, it's not only people that is important to protect, it's also the machines that people use. You have your physical everyday life, but you also have a kind of a digital life. And this facility is all about protecting the digital life. The facility is designed so that the power supply never fails. Two giant backup engines stand ready to produce 1.5 megawatts of power in the event of a crisis. These machines are auxiliary power engines that take over if the grid fails and provide this facility with energy. It's V16. They are about 27 liters and 1,200 horsepower. When the machine starts, it's it awesome. There is no exception. It's absolutely the coolest facility in the world. So this is the ultimate underground world. It couldn't be any better. These places are part of our history because they can explain to us in a very evocative way the world of the Cold War, what it was like to live during the Cold War era and know that the nuclear war can come tomorrow or the day after that. During the Cold War era, from the mid-1940s to the early 1990s, Sweden wanted to protect itself from attack. The strategic position of Sweden, we had to defend our territory and defend the civil structures of society. Many countries in Europe, among them Sweden, started to shield the population so that people could survive an attack. Here, in the center of Stockholm, underneath a church, is Clara Shelter. It has a sign that every Swedish resident knows well. This symbol, uh, orange square and uh, blue triangle, is you, you can see it all around Sweden, uh, in houses and along streets, and it tells you that this is a public shelter. Clara Shelter is a concrete structure that is encased and protected by the granite bedrock of Stockholm. We are standing in the main shelter tunnel, and this is actually a house within a cave. And the point is that you have the ability for the rock and the building to move separately. So if there's an atomic bomb blast above our heads, the, the rock will shake, but the building will not shake with it. Built between 1958 and 1961, it can be turned into an emergency population shelter in less than 48 hours. It's one of four large population shelters. And uh, this place could house up to 16 
thousand people. Its architect, Alan Varner, designed a long spiral tunnel that splits into two levels. To make Clara shelter, they had to blast 65,000 cubic meters of bedrock. To build the shelter itself, they needed 12,000 cubic meters of uh, reinforced concrete. 15 meters below the surface, the shelter would be accessed from the streets and subway above. If the air raid sirens went off, people would rush down the many stairways from streets, from the subway, and then come into the large tunnels, and then the blast doors would close. One can only imagine 20,000 people down here and uh, the light starts to flicker and the ground and the walls shake. It would have been quite terrifying, I guess. If the shelter had ever been needed, civilians would have found themselves guided safely into the refuge. People in the center of Stockholm was directed down these stairways by civil defense people. The color coding on the railing here is used so that the civil defense people can show different kinds of people the right way down. You have to imagine hundreds, even thousands of people rushing down these stairways. You're a pregnant woman, yellow railing. Uh, old age pensioner, green. City official, red. It has to be quick and the sirens are sounding up in the street and then they can avoid panic and make everything run as smooth as possible. Doors made of steel and concrete weighing 70 tons were built to withstand a nuclear blast one kilometer up in the atmosphere. This is the main blast doors for the shelter. And uh, in case of an emergency, they would shut automatically uh, and they are powered by small diesel engines. And when they are closed, the plates on the ground flips up and the doors closed. And that is how you seal the place off. Because the blast from a nuclear explosion consists, of course, of, of uh, wind and everything. But the pressure, the air pressure, rises very, very quickly. So the doors would have to handle that. These specific doors, they can close in two or three minutes. And it's made to protect people from the blast, from the radiation, and from poison gases, uh, fire, and so on. In the event of a nuclear attack, Sweden's citizens were advised to be prepared to survive down here for one month. People were supposed to bring with them blankets and some food, canned foods, bread, uh, and so on. Everything down here is supposed to be functioning even after the municipal power has been shut down. Wells, water cisterns, uh, air purification facilities, reserve power plants. This place is supposed to be totally self-sufficient. The survivors couldn't have stayed underground forever. You would eventually have to send someone up to the surface to check for radiation. So that person would then dress in a hazard suit and venture out with a Geiger counter and measure how dangerous it is. And then when they come down, they will not be allowed in to this sealed space. They would have to speak via these kind of systems to the guards inside. And these are for when it's okay to come inside and when it's not okay to come inside. Green and red light. And if everything is okay, the inner doors are open. So there was a system for gaining entrance to this place once the large blast doors were closed. Clara Shelter is now used every day as an underground garage. But Sweden remains alert to threat.
Four times a year, it tests its public warning system. In 2018, Sweden's government issued emergency guidance for its people called If Crisis or War Comes. It was sent to 4.8 million households. Sweden remains prepared. In southwest England, deep in the Mendip Hills of Somerset, lies one of the most spectacular landscapes in the UK. Cheddar Gorge was formed more than one million years ago when melting glacial waters carved into limestone rock. It left behind near vertical cliffs and a mysterious subterranean world. Beneath this breathtaking landscape lie secret caverns and magical rock formations. Can you imagine seeing this for the first time? You'd be like, wow, what's this? But how were they created? Why did humans come to explore here? Richard Goff was looking for a, a show cave, and boy, did he find one. And what can we learn from its hidden secrets? These tight squeezes make visibility quite difficult. So you've got this entire hidden network and new kind of treasures to find, which makes the whole lot worth it in the end. The gorge is almost 120 meters deep and five kilometers long. At its heart is one of Britain's oldest underground worlds, Cheddar Caves. This is one of the best caves in the country. So the whole cave is a phreatic karst system, which basically means it was formed by one big river, which is now sunk below this cave system. All of this formed by the pressure of water. It's amazing to see what water really can do. The story of this magnificent cave system begins at its entrance with an extraordinary discovery of a 10,000-year-old complete skeleton of prehistoric man. A search to find the closest ancestor of the skeleton, known affectionately as Cheddar Man, sparked the interest of local teacher Adrian Target. What I really wasn't prepared for was the extent to which this story suddenly became global. DNA extracted from Cheddar Man's tooth was tested against local students from Adrian's school. But the test threw up an unexpected match. We were told there was only one result, and the man who was interviewing me said, and it's you, and he looked at me and said, you're the one. So it was a bit of a shock. He was found very close to the entrance. So it'll be interesting to see how we can compare what the caves were like then with what we see today. Paul Hemmington is an expert on these caves. He's meeting Adrian in the very place where Cheddar Man, his ancestor, was found in 1903. Well, it was a hunter-gatherer, so they would have gone out to hunt for their food, horse and deer at that time, and would have gathered fruit, nuts, seeds, berries, and as the sea wasn't too far away, they would have had fish on the diet. Although fish bones are hard to find evidence of, but they would have certainly had limpets, mollusks. So that would have been quite a good diet, actually. Very good, it? actually, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm kind of on it now. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's uh, very, very good because, of course, there's no refined sugar. And deer is very healthy. It is indeed, yeah, very nice too. In the winter time, of course, things would have frozen over. So it is believed, really, that they may well have been outside of the cave, would have been in a kind of yurt-type tent, and then during the summer, they would have resided in here. Uh, this is the, the river now that formed this cave. It's now dropped, it now runs underneath, and uh, the whole reason why Cheddar Man was discovered was because this was to alleviate the flooding that obviously still happens to this day. Cheddar Man was discovered after a new wave of tourism during the reign of Queen Victoria. The middle classes had more time and money on their hands than ever before. The Great Western Railway arrived here in Cheddar in 1869. So people in their finery, they would come here and walk up and down. Local man Richard Goff 
saw an opportunity to take advantage of the large number of tourists flocking to Cheddar by opening the caves to the public. It was really, really a bit of a raconteur, very enthusiastic. He was looking for a, a show cave, and boy, did he find one. Though the caves were known about before Goff's time, there had been no opportunity to explore the full extent of this magical world before he dug it all out, with the help of his two eldest sons, William and Arthur. What's unique about this underground world is that the limestone is marine limestone. It was once on the seabed when the UK was under a warm tropical sea near the equator. So it's crushed dead organic matter, which contains crinoids, coral, and brachiopods. And then thrust fault and fold, the mendits were formed, and here we are now. Richard and his sons have broken through this massive boulder choke, blasted through about eight yards to access and open out the rest of the cave. For two years, they continued this painstaking work on their hands and knees into the unknown. His first discovery was like a gift from the gods. Richard Goff called them the fonts. Can you imagine seeing this for the first time? You'd be like, wow, what's this? Formed over thousands of years, pure white crystals called calcite are deposited when rainwater with dissolved limestone evaporates. It takes about a 1,000 years for a cubic centimetre to form. Calcite is white in its purest form, and the red is iron oxide, which is all mixed together to give that wonderful sort of dry waterfall effect. These nine basins range from a few inches to four feet and are called gua pools. They name the fonts after what you would see within a church, the fonts that are used to baptise babies with. That's what they reminded him of. This is the power of nature. This is what nature can do. This is what water can do. And he's probably thinking, where does that lead to? It, it, it makes you feel quite, quite small in a way to see the wonderments of how this has been formed. Goff continued to come face to face with Mother Nature's beauty. I absolutely love this. This is obviously like a copper beaten effect. Uh, the actual name is scalloping. So this is where the river has reached the ceiling of the rock. It's not allowing it to take any more out in certain areas. And so it's lapping against the rock and creates this wonderful, as I say, it's like a so copper. So this is beaten. entirely natural. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because yeah. it looks beautifully delicate. It it's, does. It's, it really if does. If a craftsman had beaten it almost, doesn't it? it? Exactly right. It really is incredible. On his hands and knees, Richard Goff continued excavating tons of rock and silt on his mission to riches. 100 meters from the font, he arrived at his next marvel. Oh, wow, that's magnificent, isn't it? Isn't it just? Just imagine coming through, crawling four years to get to this point on your hands and knees, and you come into this. Goff called his next discovery St. Paul's after the famous cathedral in the city of London. Absolutely wonderful. It's a fantastic spectacle, isn't it? it? It really is. It just opens out, so, you, you know... It looks liquid in places. It does, that's right. Well, this is an amazing view. One can't imagine, really, how inspiring it must have been to have seen this natural phenomenon, complete with uh, its delicate shapes, but also the different colours as well. It must have been really awe-inspiring to have seen that for the first time. Goff's desire to open the caves as a spectacle for tourists was realised once he broke through to the Diamond Chamber. By 1899, splendours that were once lit by candles and gas lamps were now brilliantly displayed in electric light. OK, Adrian, check this out. Wow, look at that. That's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely. If I had a pound for every time somebody got to that point over there and said, wow, well, I'll be a rich man. The diamond chamber is 28 metres high and is thought to contain 60,000 tonnes of limestone. It's the last and largest of Goff's discoveries and home to an eye-catching formation. 
Niagara Falls formed when a stalactite and stalagmite joined together. It's believed that the cave dried out 250,000 years ago. It's a quarter of a mile in, so it's like a journey. I said, it was a journey through time. Yes. Uh, 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 and nature itself, and that's really what makes this so, so special. So Richard Goff, to reach this point, it took him eight years of his life, and he was 71 by the time he reached this end chamber. While prehistoric humans only ever ventured to the mouth of the cave, Goff and his sons uncovered majestic spaces once hidden deep within. Still to this day, explorers continue to search these caves just like Goff did in the hope they will find the next diamond chamber. One of these cavers is Sam Rasmussen. It's not really for the faint-hearted. You've got to kind of face your fears as you go through the cave. To see just how challenging Goff would have found navigating the Cheddar cave systems, Sam has offered to film himself on a small camera. Uncharted caves can be very, very tight. They can have loose rocks as you go through. So, of course, you do have the risk of rock falls perhaps happening. There are certain passages you could go down and they suddenly drop out, say, 40, 50 feet. So you need to be prepared for these things to happen. Um, but, of course, we can only be so prepared. Going further in, of course, there will be no natural light. Wave your hand in front of your face, you won't be able to see it at all. You can open and close your eyes, it'll be exactly the same. You won't see any difference at all. Sam is entering the Black Cat Chamber. It's a part of Goff's cave, not open to the general public, unless with a guide. Get all these different colours from the different minerals coming down through the calcite. So it's mostly brownie red from the iron oxide or red ochre making its way down. Hidden from view, the further wonders of the cave are reserved for the bravest of visitors. Crawling through these narrow spaces can be both uncomfortable and potentially dangerous. These tight squeezes make visibility quite difficult. You see small gaps that you perhaps want to give, give a go at trying to get through. It's not really for the faint-hearted. Um, you do have to have that sense of adventure. You've got to kind of face your fears as you go through the cave. And these are the places you look for when you go caving. Finding something like this is a huge reward for your physical effort. And coming out on the other side, seeing something that perhaps somebody has never seen before. It's, it's quite kind of sensory uh, depriving, really. And it's quite damp in there, but with the lack of light, you hear certain sounds a little bit more, so you hear strange sounds as you're going through the cave. I see some evidence of excavation here and there as well. Nice little passage. Experienced cavers are still exploring new areas of the system to this day. There are still, our passages still being discovered. We've still got dig sites going on through the gorge and even in this cave as well. Got this entire hidden network of um, kind of tunnels and, and new kind of treasures to find through these cave systems, which makes the whole lot worth it in the end. These magnificent caves continue to attract thousands of people from all over the world. And adventurers who continue to explore this stunning complex of caves. It's amazing to think that Cheddar Man who resided at the entrance of the cave never realized that he was on the threshold, if you like, of a fabulous underground world. Southeastern Europe, bordering the Black Sea. 
a landmass of 240,000 square kilometers, ringed by the Great Carpathian mountain range. But beneath its landscape lies one of history's greatest riches. This location is actually one of our secrets. How were huge caverns created? They needed almost 200 years to create this huge hollow shape. And after centuries of mining, what have they become? You have no idea when you're above that underneath your feet you have an underground world like this. Thirteen million years ago in what is now Romania, a prehistoric sea ringed by mountains evaporated. It left huge salt deposits covering approximately 45 square kilometers. The history of this place is pretty amazing. The Romans settled here in the ancient city of Potaisa. Historian Paul Florenturian has been studying the excavations of salt here that date back to the time when Rome ruled Dacia, now modern Romania. They discovered uh, salt resources of the area, and uh, they started to mining up. Salt was prized for its ability to preserve and season food. In fact, we get the English word salary from the Latin word for salt. They will dig a hole, and after a couple of years, the hole will fill up with water, and they will just uh, continue digging another and another and another. These early digs barely scratched the surface of the enormous resources later discovered deep underground. Some areas of the deposits across Romania go as deep as 1.2 kilometers. Mines expert Edmund Christian Popper explains the techniques used by medieval pioneers to extract salt. This is the marks left by the tools. So they were using hand tools, chisels and hammers. It was something like this. Well, they were considered quite efficient when they were trying to cut blocks of equal size. With simple tools, workers excavated the salt by digging ever deeper. The deeper they dug, it became more difficult to lift the heavy salt out of the mine. So an ingenious device was created to do this. this piece of equipment we see here would have been powered with the help of horses. They were attaching one or two horses, being able to slowly turn it. Up to 500 kilograms of salt could be lifted out of the mine in one go. They are connecting this mechanism with a pulley system. The idea of using uh, a system like this one was first applied in the 11th century. It was an approach used for almost 800 years. It is essentially the grandfather of the modern elevator. So this is uh, the shaft from where they were extracting that loaded sack of salt. Underneath the pulley system, there is a shaft which is very, very deep, about 90 meters deep. Large quantities of salt would have been brought up to this platform, loaded into trolleys, and these trolleys were pulled by horses through the tunnel directly to the surface. So we can see here the railway sleepers. They were using a narrow gauge railway system for transporting salt to the surface with the help of special trolleys. The tunnel is perfectly straight in order to make it as effortless as possible for the horses to transport salt to the surface as the load itself was already very, very large. The technique of creating deep, bell-shaped mines below a central winch was used at several locations over the centuries. The steep-sided walls of these mines meant they wouldn't collapse as workers excavated ever deeper. Paul Florin has joined Edmund to see the deepest of them at Salina Turda, the Turetia mine. This is one of the bell-shaped chambers. It's one of the deepest and the oldest one from around here. Mining began here in 1690 and took almost 200 years to create this huge hollow shape. 
they used only uh, simple technology to mine salt that makes it more amazing, more impressive. The base of the mine is 112 meters below the surface and 75 meters across. Due to the infiltration of water, an eight meter deep underground lake was formed with a salt island in the middle. This island is an artificial one. It was created in the middle and the end of the 19th century. Blocks of salt that failed to reach the standards they were looking for were thrown back into the Terizia mine. Over the years, it's formed this impressive island that now stands five meters high above water. Since salt extraction ceased here, Salina Torrida has been transformed into a magical underground gallery. The structures here utilize the only building material that can withstand the corrosive effects of high salt concentrations. The structures are actually the, the heritage of hundreds and hundreds of years of experience. 900 years ago, workers began using spruce wood in all their beams, supports and equipment. They discovered its loose grain structure absorbs salt, creating a layer preventing the wood from decomposing. Even today, in modern times, we still use spruce wood. It's the only type of wood that can be used in this environment. For centuries, workers continued to dig deep, bell-shaped mines. However, excavating large amounts of salt from the bottom was time-consuming and inefficient. After 800 years of digging down in this way, miners realized that by digging horizontally, the salt could be more easily and quickly extracted. A new way to mine salt was invented. So this is uh, the Rudolph chamber. It's a trapezoid-shaped uh, mining work. They are not as deep as the bell-shaped chambers. They concentrate on a larger area, a larger surface. So this is 99.3% sodium chloride, high quality salt, has no color, it's colorless. Even the walls are transparent, but as they are very, very thick, they are kilometers thick, you cannot see beyond them. That's why they look very, very dark, because of the lack of light and because they are very, very thick. Salina Torrida's salt mines have been at the heart of this region for centuries. To this day, engineers continue to ensure this incredible underground space remains relevant. In 1932, salt excavation ended here. But in 2008, this space was reinvented into the world's first underground amusement park. Activities here include mini golf and bowling. There are handball and football fields, pool tables and table tennis. There's also a 180-seater amphitheater. Plus the most spectacular attraction, a Ferris wheel. This is actually custom made for our salt mine. Uh, it was brought here piece by piece and welded together here on this spot. It's not something you see every day. Standing at an impressive 20 meters high, the Ferris wheel is a world first. We're at a height of about 25 meters right now, and we are very close to the stalactites. The stalactites are very, very impressive. These are totally from, uh, from salt, not from calcium or gypsum. How long does it take to form? These stalactites form approximately two centimeters per year. They yeah. older than one, than 100 years. The size of the chambers was the thing that really surprised me. So you have no idea when you're above that underneath your feet you have an underground world like, like this one. A second trapezoid chamber was planned. The service tunnel and winch chamber were completed, but the project was abandoned during Romania's communist era. Years later, the winch chamber was redeveloped for use in a complementary health treatment known as halotherapy. 
one of the team at Salina Torda, or Solia Colossi, is meeting patients who have come here for therapy. Some have come a very long way. People who come here for treatment, they usually suffer of asthma or allergies, also respiratory problems. Exposure to the salt mine's microclimate is thought to have beneficial effects on the airways. With high numbers of salt particles here and with very little air movement, there are virtually no allergens to breathe in. Our son suffers a form of asthma. This mother brought her son all the way from Britain for treatment. Here yeah, we didn't have to use the inhaler at all, which is a really good thing, and we're hoping that in the future that we won't need it anymore. Children are encouraged to play in this salty version of a sandpit to expose them to microscopic particles of salt. This breathing is much more relaxed, and I'm confident that it will help him. It's amazing here. Even though the mine has been changed into a spectacular amusement park for thousands to enjoy, there are still places only a few get to venture. From the highest point above Turizia Mine. This location is actually one of our secrets. It hasn't been revealed to the public. We're about 116 meters above. It's a very unique perspective. To the deepest, darkest depths of the abandoned Joseph chamber, where the remnants of the mining work can still be found, something no tourist will witness. There is only a limited number of people who have access to this chamber. We have visitors testing the echoes from the balconies. Hello. Uh, it hasn't been modernized yet. It's, it's very interesting to see how a chamber like this looks like when it's empty. And you can really feel the pressure of this large space. Oh, this is very, very old. These are nails from the railway system, probably 18th century. So this is a bolt from the structure holding up the shafts, probably about 200 years old. People created this, this huge chamber and they came here and they worked and extracted all this salt. I can only imagine how long it took them and how hard work it was for them. This is a, a piece of wood on which salt has recrystallized naturally. So this is probably underneath the water surface for a long period of time for this to happen. All the crystals have a cubical shape. That's amazing. It's essentially a, a step back into the past. The skill of Romania's underground enthusiasts means Selena Torda's past and present have been seamlessly combined for the benefit of generations to come.